Hi, welcome to episode 24 of the American Tributaries podcast, where to break out of the bubbles we've been living in these last few years, we are using modern technology to explore the various currents of people in our great country, kind of like a 21st century Lewis and Clark journey. I'm your host, Michael Whitten, and thank you for joining me in this exploration of America. If you enjoy listening, please subscribe on whatever platform you're using. Give us a like in this particular episode and check us out on Instagram at American Tributaries Podcast. Today, I'm thrilled to be joined by Wilk Wilkinson. Wilk lives in Minnesota, and we were connected through the organization Braver Angels, which was started in 2016 to build bridges across the political spectrum. Um, Wilk um, looks like online has a lot of different things going on, uh, one of which is a podcast called Derate the Hate, um, which asks the questions in its um, tagline, what have you done today to you know make your life a better life? And what have you done today to make the, the world a better place, which I think are two very empowering questions. Um, Wilk, thanks so much for you know joining me today. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, Michael. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. No, this is this is great. Um, so you are you're actually on the road right now. Are you in Minnesota or somewhere else? I am in Minnesota. I'm up in northern Minnesota, Virginia, uh, okay. Virginia, Minnesota specifically. So okay, yeah, it's uh, it's up in the Iron Range area around the Taconite Mines and the Iron Mines uh, in northern Minnesota. Okay, well, we're already going to territory that's terra incognito to me. <laughs> I think, I get, and I think maybe that's the part of this part of the reason to do this podcast is like when I hear the words like Minnesota, um, you know, really it's the it's the Minnesota Twins that come to mind. That's why I know what the map, the know what the state looks like, and I don't really know. I wish I could say I knew a lot about Minnesota, but I, but I don't. Like, can you have you lived there your entire life? I have not. No, I, I've lived. Uh... I lived in Minnesota for a very, very short period of time during high school, and then um, my folks lived here when, uh, um, or for a lot longer than I did. And uh, in 2009, I had lived in in the state of Florida for several years uh, after getting out of the well while I was in the Navy, and then getting out of the Navy. And and uh, in 2009. My folks started having a lot more health issues, so I came back up here to help take care of them. Okay. Well, it's, it sounded like you did like the reverse trip. Usually people go from, I guess, any place cold down to Florida, but you went the other way. <laughs> yeah. Uh, ironically, yeah. I, I, one of the most most asked questions that I receive is, why would you ever leave Florida and come to Minnesota? <laughs> <laughs> and uh yeah it was uh it was strictly to to take care of family doing what uh doing what i needed to do to to uh for the for the benefit of my family and that's why i'm here sure now, you know and, and personally like i mean i i don't i think i'm a bit too warm-blooded it might be because of the extra like 50 or 60 pounds i have on me but mm-hmm. i i don't to me like the idea of being in a place that's hot all the time or humid all the time I don't know that I can handle. So I, I'm not going to say that like being in a, the, a 10 degree day in, in New York City is something I enjoy doing, but I don't know if I could do a hot, you know, oppressively hot, humid summer for three or four or five months. Yeah, I put on a good 40 pounds <clears throat> since I, I moved up here from Florida, too. So, yeah, I, I get it. I, uh, um, yeah, I don't know if I could handle the heat again. I mean, I'm sure I could. I, I can adapt pretty much to any climate, but. But, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely a different climate, you know, down in Florida, it was a lot of hundred degrees day, a hundred degree days, hundred degree or hundred percent humidity. And, uh, up here we we get the summers where you've got the hundred degree days and, and nearly hundred percent humidity, but you also have the winters where you've got no humidity and it's 35 below zero and 35 mile an hour winds. And, and, uh, yeah, it's kind of the, uh nightmarish bookends of the weather spectrum here in uh in minnesota wow um, where where i mean i know that i mean lake superior is there but where does all that humidity come from uh well minnesota's uh, uh says lakes. it's the land of ten thousand lakes okay. there's actually a lot more lakes than ten thousand but oh. but yeah there's you know minnesota's got a lot of a lot of lakes a lot of water um a lot of swampy area and then it's just you know, uh, in years, well, not recently, we've had a couple drought style years, but then there's, you know, there's obviously a good, good amount of rain here and that's why it's good farming country and, and stuff like that. So, 
Mm-hmm. Um, so, and what was it like for you when you, I mean, like, how have you settled into Minnesota and like where, where in Minnesota are you living? So I live right now in, uh, uh, a town about 40 miles or 40 minutes Northwest of Minneapolis. So, uh, so pretty much dead center in the middle of the state on the, um, you know, right along interstate, interstate 94. Hmm. And can I ask um, what, what your line of work is outside of maintaining the various uh, w- websites that you've got up? I am a distribution manager for a welding supply company currently. Okay. So I've been in the uh, transportation and distribution business for uh, 22, a little over 22 years now. So, um, I do, uh, yeah, welding, welding gases and welding supplies distribution now. It's I did wine distribution for twelve years before I started doing this, and uh, I I guess like under when like when you're not in the distribution business at all, like when I was a lawyer, like you just think things like magically appear, <laughs> and, and and then like seeing how complicated it is, how for things to magically appear, I, I have so much like regard for the the distribution system, and I, I'm sure you you've had a a lot of headaches in the last few years. Yeah, you know, the the supply chain issues that our country has been facing, and quite honestly, the world, uh, have been been a struggle for everybody. And, and yeah, those of us that are in, in the distribution business, it's something we contend with every day. It's not, uh, it's not pretty, and uh, hopefully it'll get better. I mean, yeah. it's, you know, it, it, there's certainly industries, you know, that are, are much worse off than we are. Um, so, but we do have, uh, we do have a good team, a team where I'm at and a, a good supply chain management system here. And, and, uh, so, so yeah, we're, we're doing, doing, uh, doing well, despite the circumstances for sure. Yeah. Um, and was it something, was that the same kind of work you were then doing when you were in Florida? I was in the, well, I, I was in the transportation and distribution business, but I was in propane distribution at that point. Okay. I, uh, I, when I, uh, when I got out of the service in, in, uh, 1998, I was going to college for computer programming and was driving cab and, and, uh, just did, was not in any position at that point that I wanted to sit at a desk or, or sit in a cubicle and, and program computers. So I actually, I went to truck driving school in uh in 1999 and got my cdl and started driving truck over the road and and that kind of led into me being a route driver down there in central florida and then 2004 i started delivering propane and and uh delivered uh hundreds of thousands of cylinders and and millions of gallons of propane over the next 17 and a half years and and uh yeah got into management you know, later on in that, uh, in that period. And, and, uh, yeah, now I, now I manage drivers, I manage, uh, facilities and I don't manage any facilities right now. Now I strictly manage drivers and, and, uh, uh, drivers and trucks and things like that. Mm-hmm. I mean, pr- propane, I mean, I, I would, the first, I, I was in the Navy as well and I got out a year before you did. Um, I was uh, stationed in Yokosuka, Japan from 94 to 97. Okay. So right. where where did you serve? I was in Florida for the majority of the time, uh, okay. honestly. I uh I was going to uh um to nuke school down there in Oh wow. in in Orlando mm-hmm. and uh was having a lot of problems with my knees and I I uh had a torn meniscus and uh. things and and uh so they ended up just uh we ended up parting ways, let's say. Uh, I mean, I get because you can't really even go up and down ladders and stuff if you've got really bad knees. Is that why, among other things? Uh, I guess. I mean, yeah. really, the the biggest thing for me was at the time I, I just I couldn't do the running. Um, mm. I, okay. I, could, I could do everything else fine. I just I couldn't handle the running. We were, you know, and uh, apparently that was a that was a disqualifier. So yeah, yeah. Yeah. When I was choosing like 
duty stations, it was so tempting. Like, cause I, I'm the, like one of the, like you could go to Mayport, you could go to Norfolk, you could go to San Diego and I, 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 you could go to like, you know, Hawaii. And I was just like, I think I've like, I grew up on Long Island and I would never traveled. So I was like, what's the farthest place I can go. And I was like, Oh, there's a base in Japan. Yeah. Send me there. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, you know, I grew up in the Midwest and, and, uh, was incredibly poor growing up and and stuff so i'd never really been you know anywhere the first furthest i'd been away from northwest iowa was denver colorado and we lived there for a while when i was a kid and uh so other than living all over the midwest i hadn't really been too far and uh and basically with with my uh entry exam into the military and my ASVAP, you know, my ASVAP score and the, and the, uh, and the nuke test, I, I was, uh, able to choose pretty much whatever I wanted to do in the military and, and, uh, nuke school sounded appealing because it was in central Florida or it was in Orlando, Florida, and I'd never been there. So that's what I chose. And it was cool. It was very cool. I ended up living, ended up staying in Orlando for 13 years. So uh, and um, what would did you want to go on a carrier or, or, or submarine or what was your what was your hopes? Submarines was was the plan. Okay. Um, again, that that was that was the always oh, oh, <laughs> that was always the confusing part to me is like how far can I run on a submarine? <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. uh, no, it it, uh, it is what it is. It's yeah. uh, certainly one of the biggest regrets of my life. You know, getting out before I finished my uh, my enlistment, but. It is what it is. Well, yeah, I see. I mean, I was just saying to somebody today, I was like, I feel like the way I have tried to live my life is I I didn't want to, I wouldn't want to ever look back and say like, I didn't give it a shot. Like, it's not like, it's not really about succeeding because there's lots of things that you, that you can't control the outcome for, but I want to at least know that I tried as best I could. And it sounds like that's certainly your situation. So. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, I did the best I could at the time and, you know, there's been several times over the past several years where, you know, I've tried to get back into running to see if I could do it. And, and, uh, I can usually keep it up for a month or two. And and then I get to the point where I'm back in a knee brace and limping around and and stuff like that. Yeah. I've been, uh, been very physical in my careers over the years, but just it's the running, my, my body, I'm just not built physically to, uh, handle the shock on my knees that comes along with running. So it's been, uh, been a uh been a problem yeah do you do you have any kids i do yep okay. i got How a uh, i got a 13 year old stepson and a two and a half year old daughter so. oh wait so you got a teenager and a little bit little still kind of a baby at home yep <laughs> yeah she's a toddler and and uh yeah a toddler going on a teenager quite honestly i mean she's got <laughs> uh she's got a lot of attitude and and uh definitely has her uh her ways of doing things so mm-hmm. but uh no it's it's been great um you know i love uh you know i've been my my son and my my wife have been in my life since uh since he was six and and uh and then uh you know and then then we decided to have a, a child together and and my daughter is just absolutely incredible so no i love uh you know, love my wife, love my life, love my kids, and I'm just a blessed guy. Yeah, that, that's great. Um, I, I myself have three. I have a 16 year old and a daughter, and then a 12 year old boy and a 10 year old boy, and those are the three that I'm keeping at bay. So, <laughs> I don't know if you have a studio for your podcast, but I've never been able. My wife has like whenever she looks at my my podcast, she's always like, "You need to do something." And I'm like, "I I live in an apartment. There's no there's no area to like have any kind of like pretty background. It just it's gonna be what it is." I'd say it's kind of like you know podcasting unplugged. So you can see what groceries I have in the background. <laughs> right. <laughs> Usually it gets cut out. And anyway, when I do, when I do the editing and put the two faces next to each other, but um the uh i was thinking about like my kids like i've told them like when i'm talking to them about sports and like you know i used to play sports too and they just look at me like no you didn't i'm like no i really did like i ran a marathon once too and like no no they don't believe they don't believe the like of it so (laughs) like yeah i know i can't run now but i really did i can't believe i'm at that point in my life where i have to harken back to the days when i could do physically do things but you know it is what it is (laughs) yeah i uh you know i i 
running has always been a problem for me. I, I, you know, I was never much of an athlete, but, uh, um, you know, I, I boxed in high school and, and, uh, you know, I played a little bit of football and, and stuff like that, but, you know, running was always, or just was always a, a point of contention for me. Like I said, I, I, even from, uh, from a young kid and, and, and whatever, I just, you know, running just never agreed with my body very well for whatever reason. I don't know if it's because of the way that I run or, or whatever, but, you know, I, I always had to try to build my stamina in, in other ways and, and, uh, yeah, not much yeah. of an athlete just wasn't, uh, wasn't able to do it. You know, it got me through boot camp, got me through a school, got, uh, got me most of the way through nuke school and stuff like that. But then just the, uh, constant trying to, trying to run never, yeah. uh, just constantly damaging my knees further and further. And it's been a problem my whole life. So, yeah. Yeah. There's not much you can do either, unfortunately. Um, it seems, um, so you started the, when did you start your podcast? I started my podcast. I think it was in April of 2020. Okay. So, um, so yeah, I've got, uh, about, let's see, 121. I think this week will be 122 weeks in a row that I've put out an episode. So haven't missed a week yet. It's been, uh, um, yeah, so that's uh, whatever that brings us back to. I think it was April of twenty twenty. That's amazing. I, I've already I've, I've missed a few when I go away on vacation. I'm just like I, I can't I can't do it. <laughs> so I'm I'm impressed that you were able to keep up that pace. Bravo to you. <laughs> I appreciate it. Yeah, I, I you know I I for the most part, and I don't put a you know I know a lot of people when they're doing their podcasts, they have you know they have a couple episodes in the can just ready to go for certain situations if if you know if they're going out of town or or things like that but um generally mine are pretty close to you know the week of you know the week of publication so if i have something coming up um occasionally i'll do one ahead of time if i know i'm going to be out of town or whatever but you know like like this week this uh this came up uh, where I had to go out of town for work and, and next week, the same thing. So, you know, I'll, uh, I'll try to do the best I can to get them, uh, get them completed and get them out and we'll get them out. It comes out every morning or, or every Wednesday morning at 6 a.m. Central. So, okay. All right. Wow. Um, did you look at different days to do the release or was that just kind of where you started and you stayed there? Uh, right at first it kind of varied, uh, on when I could get it out, I think some of them came out on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And, and then I realized pretty quick that I wanted to have consistency. So I just buckled down and said, Wednesday morning at 6 a.m. is what it's going to be. And that's going to be, you know, putting that deadline on me because, uh, when I was doing it, when I was just like, okay, well, as long as I get it out during the week, it's fine. Uh, but then it seemed like, you know, just because of the nature of things or, or my nature being a procrastinator and things like that, you know, I'd, I'd wait until the last minute and then I get pushed off and then I get pushed off. So, so yeah, I had to set that deadline for myself to make sure that that's when it was getting done and, and that's when it was coming out. And I mean, how long was the idea of doing a podcast kind of ruminating in your, your brain and like, what, um, I like, well, guess what, what, uh, what prompted it? I, mean, I think the title kind of suggests what you what prompted it, but um, can you talk a little bit more about how you got started and why you got started? Yeah. So originally, what it was was the I had a t shirt business for a while uh, called uh, Failed Understanding Apparel. It was kind of a F, kind of a double entendre on the concept of fu apparel. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and what it was, was there was a lot of concepts out there that, uh, people were making a big deal about that, that I didn't necessarily think should have been a big deal. And, and it caused a lot of, uh, disagreement, let's say. And so I would advertise these shirts on social media. And some of the things that were, people were saying to me was just, very toxic, very, very hateful and whatever. 
So I thought about doing a just kind of a haters happy hour kind of thing once a week, just talking about and pointing out the hateful things that people were saying to me online and then to saying, saying to other people online that kind of disagreed with them. And then I really, the more I thought about it, the more I thought, you know what, that's not really doing this service to anybody, you know, just pointing out the the toxicity and the negativity. I want to do something that's actually going to try and better the world, you know, and, and better the attitudes. And instead of, instead of propping up the keyboard warriors and all those that are out there, you know, trying to worsen public discourse, I wanted to do something to try and better public discourse and by doing so bettering attitudes. And, and one of the things that has really changed my life around is just understanding that, that most things uh, with regard to happiness come out of, and most things with regard to bettering the world come out of gratitude and personal accountability and, and stuff like that. So that's kind of what I started building my platform on and uh, just kind of took it from there. And it, and it really was all about bettering the world one attitude at a time. That's That's what it's all about. You know, personal accountability, gratitude, understanding and recognizing that we as individuals have the are the only ones that have the power to change our own mood and uh it just kind of started taking off from there I, then i had an opportunity to interview some amazing guests and became familiar and 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 had others become familiar with me based on those uh tenants i guess so to speak and it's, it's just kind of taken on a life of its own that's great. Uh, when when I when I got started with mine, there was somebody. Who, I guess I, one of my friends had commented, like you know, a lot of people say they're going to do something like that, but it's very few that do do it. So I mean, kudos to you for for doing it then and doing so much of it uh, for the last few years. Um, and I and I and I think I've like I guess it, for me, like I guess from when I got started. Um, it's probably really the result of like, like a, I, for me, there was some kind of tipping point in how I was thinking about the world. And it, like, it started with like the 2016 election and like, you can guess the political climate in Brooklyn, New York, it's what you would expect it to be. And, you know, I, I guess I'd say I, I was like fully into that mindset, but there was something that just kind of popped in how I was like, what I was seeing to where I was just like, you know what, we're contributing to this too. Like we're all, we're, we're all part of this. And, I'm not, I, I can sit here and say what other people are supposed to do, but like, we've got to look at what we can do because we can control ourselves better than we can control other people. And that's what we should be focusing on. Um, and I guess I've learned that that's like a stoic principle. Um, so I, that at least I've followed some like podcasts and Instagram stuff, just like better about stoic principles. And it definitely kind of reaffirms that. But to me, it was actually in, in April of 2020 as well. I started writing, um, trying to make sense of the world and trying to because i didn't want to kind of continue to be immersed in this kind of like the cycle of anger and rage that i think we're all kind of like feeling um right. and, and yeah and, and i've found like that i sound similar to you it just kind of feels good to feel like you're at least trying to be a, a force that or a counterforce to what's out there just trying to get us raging and angry at each other yeah no it's it, it is and and it seems like the more uh, the more people become involved in this, you know, internet ecosystem and, and the, the, all the things that come along with social media. Um, yeah, you're right. This perpetual cycle of outrage and, and things like that. And, and there's just not enough of us out there, Michael, that are, uh, are doing the work to try and bring people together as opposed to, all of those out there with those loud voices that are, are trying to spread us apart. I mean, I say it all the time on my podcast, those, it seems like those that know the least say it the loudest and, uh, and not only that know the least, but, but there are those that have or put forth a concerted effort to drive a wedge in between people of differing opinions. And, you know, I, I would much rather spend my time and feel better about my life and and pass on a legacy to my children where I actually tried to say, look, we don't all have to agree, but we do all have to 
be civil to each other and be respectful of each other and try to seek out the humanity in each other, even though we disagree. And uh, I think personally, that's a lot better a world to live in. And uh, yeah. that's what I'm seeking to uh, to try and reestablish. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, you know, what I've found is that in reaching out to people, whether it's for you know this podcast or my the travel company I'm starting, is that I think there are, are like there are so many people that are actually hungry to have this. I just think that there's um, there hasn't, it, I mean, and maybe it's good that the the overall the broader media doesn't just do that because then it just becomes a different fad or a trend or something. <laughs> like I, I don't I don't know. Um, but what I can say is I've found like just like wildly broad acceptance for the ideas like when i talk to people and you know it's not to say that like i'll tell people like i'm not looking to change minds that to me my effort is hot it's in uh supra political like it's above politics i don't i'm not looking to change my i'm looking for us to just be able to talk i'm like you're saying and what i've found is like i there are three virtues that i've kind of when i do these like kind of thought experiments about any kind of like engagement or like any of these trigger issues um is like if you apply curiosity and respect and compassion to almost anything, I think you can get like kind of like a mutually acceptable um, outcome um, in, in whatever it is, and certainly in engagement. So that to me is like what I've been trying to kind of lead with is just, I mean, as you're, I guess you're seeing in the podcast, is just kind of curiosity. Let's like learn about each other. And the politics is one facet of this but at the end of the day we're all we're all just trying to get by we're all just trying to pay the bills and take care of our kids and kind of get a decent night's sleep and have enough food you know throughout the day yeah no that's that's right no you're right it's uh and and that's the thing and and it's a shame i mean i like the fact that you say you're you know super politics you're above it because too many people have made that such a staple in their lives now that they make everything political and and it's just, it's toxic. It's not good for, it's not good for us as a, as a society and, and certainly not good for uh, those that do it as an individual. So, yeah. Yeah. You know, the, the, it's the thing that what I've tried to, when I try to think about what's been going on is I, I mean, I, I, and I, I've said this before on the podcast, but I think, you know, humanity, we're wired to be able to handle a tribe of like 200, 300 people. Like that's what, that's what we're able to process. And the internet kind of all of a sudden forced us to deal with the tribe of 200 million, 300 million. And <laughs> I mean, I think there's a kind of a wildness to that. First of all, it's like a wild West. And on top of that, yeah, the loudest voices are the most extreme. And the, and, and what's the, and the wild thing is like when, what I just don't get is why like the, the media does become so predictable. Like if you want to play the media, you can, you just have to almost say like the most wild thing. And then people start talking about it and then they start arguing about it and that becomes like this hyper inflated like people like kind of like hyperventilating and outrage and it just seems kind of like crazy um and but i think that part of it and i and i think when i think about like the big companies big companies there's there's no there's no there's no there's no soul to them i mean it's not possible to right they're all just everything is managed by numbers and what it seems to me is that we've all become just these numbers in this war being waged by politicians and media and social media and special interest groups where you know all we count for is either a vote or a source of fundraising or a like or a click or an eyeball and they don't care the damage that they're causing in their like silly little things to kind of make money and better their own situation I, I, don't, I don't know if that's if you think that's the case but at least that's the only way that to me this will make sense and why i feel like this has to be like a grassroots movement to push back and say no no we're not we're not doing this anymore yeah well i, I mean i've talked about it several times uh, you know on different platforms that you know um hate sell soap and the and the way that they do that is they drive that wedge. I, I talked about it earlier in this conversation. You know, there are people out there that make a concerted effort to drive a wedge between people. So what they do is they, they put a label on you, they put you in a box, and they put you on a shelf until they're ready to use you. And and unfortunately, uh, you know, I I, I think that is, is partially true with, with corporations and, and businesses. Um, I, I think it's a much more prevalent when it comes to the media and, and social media and politicians, um, you know, 
obviously big corporations and, and you're right, Michael, when you say, you know, it, it's a numbers game and, and people are out to, to make the numbers because corporations, their purpose, you know, the reason that they are in business, uh, especially, you know, big corporations is they're beholden to the stock, uh, you know, to the stockholders. So they have to make the most profit they can for all the people who own stock in their corporation. You know, so they are going to break things down by demographics. And, and yes, those demographics are numbers. They are boxes and they are labels and they, they put you up there. But the reality is, is, is everybody that's got a dollar in their pocket is somebody that they're going to in some way try to appeal to. You know, whereas a, a politician or those in the media and whatever it's really about the numbers and, and it's really about how much they can they can drive outrage. You know, corporations aren't trying to outrage anybody. Right. They're trying yeah. to get the dollars out of people's pockets. That's what they mm -hmm. do. My, uh, the media and, and politicians, they gain power. They're not out for dollars. Some of them are. And but uh, most of them are, are stuck on the idea of power. And they, what they want to do is in order to get more power, they need more votes. And to get those votes, they have to use the hyperbolic uh, speech and, 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 and just the ad hominem attacks on the people that they think that are going to get them the most clicks or the most um, outrage. Because again, outrage sells soap, hate sells soap. That division that they they need is uh, the only way to get it is to keep one side of the aisle as pissed off as possible. They're gonna do it. Yeah, yeah, and and I think that the other thing that I realized too is that what I see happening is that you've got the either side like that. Not only do they want you to come to them, but then they want to keep you on their side. And that's where it's like, it's not enough just to bring you over, but now we have to make sure that you're scared of going. We don't want you to go back to the other side because you've been, there's an acquisition cost to getting each voter, to getting each eyeball, to getting each subscriber. So now we need to keep you on our side. So it's not enough to just draw you, but now we've got to double down to make you scared. Like we can't make you talking to the other side because if you talk to the other side, I might actually lose a voter. So we have to demonize them and I've got to present my myself as like this kind of hero um and your savior and i guess that's the thing that like i've been trying to kind of be more mindful of and i, and I think you know there's you know i'm sure we can talk and there are probably things that we disagree about there's probably a lot more things than we think that we probably agree about agree on um but i think I resent the manipulation that I'm seeing, like when I get like fundraising, like things in the mail or text messages where I'm just like, I'm looking, I'm like, you know what? You're not even offering any actual real concrete solutions to the problems that are really out there. You're just throwing out trigger words like, you know, gun rights, NRA, LGBTQ, like just things that, you know, like it's, it's like such it's lazy marketing, if nothing else. I'm just looking, I'm like, what are you doing? You're not, you're not doing anything. You're just throwing out this pamphlet with a bunch of pictures and some trigger words. And you think that that's just going to make you make me vote for you. And right. I, I think you that's, know, and I'm sure that yeah, I'm no, sure that's on the other side as well, but. Sure. I, and, and you know, if, if the, if the 2020 election has taught us anything, it's that, you know, we can't base our elections on hate. And, and when, when, uh, when they make it all about the politics of personality and they make people try to hate somebody and don't present any solutions for actual problems that people are facing, the problems that people in, in their homes talk about when they're sitting down at the dinner table with their family, no solutions are, were, were presented. It was 100% based on hate, and I'm going to do my best to make you hate this particular person, and then this is what we've got. This is what we got out of the deal. You know, we've got yeah. we've got a complete nightmare, and I know we don't want to get into a political conversation, but but I mean that's the biggest lesson that everybody should be able to take away from the politics of today. The politics of today mm -hmm. is all based solely on personality and hate, and and we need to get back to a point, Michael, where people understand that there are going to be things that we disagree upon, and disagreement does not equate to hate 
And what we have to do is we have to get back to a situation where we can talk to our neighbor, we can talk to our friends, we can talk to our relatives, and even though we don't agree on whatever, you know, I don't care if it's a political candidate or a political topic or a healthcare situation or whatever, disagreement does not equal hate. And we have to have conversations because if we don't have conversations, it just breeds ignorance amongst people that don't have the same opinion. And ignorance leads to hate. Hate leads to anger. Anger leads to violence. And then we're all in a big mess. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, it, you know, it was my experience in the Navy that kind of I, I think or maybe what I've seen, what I saw in the Navy or realized in the Navy, that kind of really was one of the the tipping points for me on, I guess, res- my resolution in trying to do this. Because, you know, <clears throat> the analogy I give is like, if you think about like an aircraft carrier, I mean, you can think about a submarine or but an aircraft carrier, but like any kind of like, like an aircraft carrier to me is like a good example because it's like, it's really a floating city, right? And you need so many different types of people. You need people who are going to cut hair. You need people who are managing supplies. You need people on the flight deck. You need the aviation fuel guys, you need the pilots, the intelligence people, you need all these different kinds of people. And all those different kinds of people are going to be different people. They're all going to have different interests and they're going to have different beliefs and different backgrounds. And the intelligence specialist who maybe likes reading poetry is going to be very different than the bosun's mate who is out there kind of just like swabbing the deck or whatever. Like it, it and you it takes and it takes all types. Um, Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. with those all types, you need to have a certain level of tolerance for expecting that, accepting that people are different. And I, and I'm sure you saw that when you're in training in Florida and I saw that, you know, in the Navy is like, you know, maybe, you know, things were different back then too, but like you just, you all did your job and then you would, you know, maybe you talked politics, maybe you didn't. And it wasn't. It was that was one tiny little facet, but I think what we've lost in our country is any our overarching sense of like what we're doing together, and I, and I and I and I blame like everybody across the board for that, like because there's been there is no sense of like what what are what are we doing this for, and, and maybe there are people that are, are talking about it, but it gets lost or it gets kind of like you know uh, you know hijacked for some other purpose because there are overarching purposes, and like what I try to talk about is. You know, like the country is, yeah, we, we need all different types. And we've got to understand that, like when you live in New York City, it's a different world than it is if you're in you know Minnesota or if you're in mm-hmm. North Dakota or if you're living in Florida. And, you know, we can have differences of opinion that don't need necessarily need to lead to being outraged or, you know, shaming or being, you know, just, you know, I don't know, angry. Mm hmm. Well, and and that's, you know, the United States of America is is one of or is the most incredible country, the most incredible experience uh, or experiment in 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 all of humankind. And and it's for the reason that we are uh, just like we talk uh, or just like on on our coins, e pluribus unum of many one, you know, that doesn't say everybody has to have the same mindset for us to move forward. Because that's not what it was ever meant to be. What it was meant to be is we are the most uh, racially diverse, multi-ethnic, multicultural, multi, um, multi-faceted nation ever in the history of mankind. And mm-hmm. the reason that we've been so successful up to this point is because everybody was able to kind of do their own thing you know, with the exception of certain mistakes that, that, you know, that, that everybody knows about. But the reality is, is, is we were not made to, and as human beings, we were not made to walk in lockstep with some dictator or some king or some queen or or something. We were able to be who we are as individuals and then come together for this common purpose of liberty you know, and, and, and now what you said there was, was important, Michael, you know, now what we have is a culture where if you're not in lockstep with my opinion, I'm going to start shaming you until you are in lockstep with my opinion. Or, you know, if, if you don't do as I say, then I am going to try and, and demonize and demoralize you 
until you uh, until you fall in line. And that's not the way that the United States was ever meant to be. That's not what made us successful. And if not corrected, it will be our downfall. Yeah, no, and and I think, you know, to me, it, to go back to that idea of like the, I guess the diversity of of skills, um, is I would say like to me that the strength of the country is having lots of different people doing different things because you never know what that new challenge is going to be. And like to me, sometimes like when you look at like the new, when you see things happening, sometimes there is that kind of like uh, hero isn't quite the right word, but that person you needed to kind of like be there is there and like they were never appreciated never paid attention to before but they were just doing their thing and they love doing that thing but then when you need that expertise it's there and on top of that there are lots of things that we need done that we don't really ever pay attention to i mean it's lots of like you know scientists and, and doctors but there's also lots of like you know truckers and everybody's trying to do their own thing and we're all so equally dependent and i think like what i've what i think one of the things that I find frustrating, and and, I, and this actually I guess relates to your prior career, but is that even like with progress and with like technology, um, things can happen even quicker than ever before. And I certainly don't think we should like you know technology is going to be it's kind of irresistible in some respects. You know, nobody misses like the operators. You know, like in the old days, you had to to make a phone call, you had to kind of like go on and talk to the operator and get connected to somebody. I think we're all happy to have cell phones. So you know, technology is, is a bit irresistible. But there are there's there are things that people want to happen and they don't think about the consequences of how it can hurt other people. And like to me, when I visit like colleges with my with my daughter, we're starting to do that. Like you'll hear people talk about the technology, technological advances and the investments that certain schools are making to kind of like work on artificial intelligence and this and that. And I hear it. And what what the only thing that tr- what troubles me is I hear them talking about this kind of these kind of advances, and I think of something like say like driverless trucks, right? A lot of people will mention that and say, "Oh, it's a great thing," but like what I never hear is the talk about what's going to happen to all those truck drivers, um, and how do they how are they going to get by? Like what 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 are you going to do? Like great, this is great that you're doing this advance, and in the law, I mean, maybe it makes sense. Maybe it's totally uncivilized to have people driving and controlling cars at all. I don't know, but you're putting in motion and you're investing a whole lot of money into things that are transformative, but also have can be very damaging to other people. And where's the compassion and thinking about how you're going to um, take care of the, I guess, the damage done. Um, I, I don't know if that yeah. really kind of ties into what we're talking about, but I think there's, there's just this element of like, think you got to think outside the bubble and think about other people and more than just yourself. You got to think about the broader community. Yeah. I mean, and the thing about that, Michael is, is there are always going to be, um, there's going to, there's going to be consequences and casualties to almost everything that happened. I mean, uh, you, you think about it back in the in the uh, late 1800s, early 1900s. There was a whole industry in this country and, and around the world uh, of people making buggies that were pulled by horses. You know, making the yokes and and, and things that that um, you know that would pull plows and 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 things like that. And saddle so there was makers. a whole industry. <laughs> yeah, saddle makers and, and and blacksmiths that you know that would would shoe you know make horseshoes and then shoe the horses and and, and things like that. And all of those people, you know, um, you know, all of those people adapted and, and moved into you know mm-hmm. uh, things, you know, and and even like you know computer programming and and now there's now there's programs that write programs and and things like that. So. You know, and the way that the way that the the computer programming thing, you know, kind of started with basic and then as basic, uh, basic plus and then C and then C plus plus and and things, things evolve. Everything is going to evolve and it's going to continue to evolve and people will either need to evolve with it or they don't. (laughs) Uh, It's just unfortunate. Mm -hmm. but, But that is. You know, it's just like uh, it's just like I, I I mentioned in in a couple of my recent conversations. You know, in in the um, the Truth and Trust Project that I'm involved in with Dr. Francis Collins. You know, freedom. You know, freedom will always have certain casualties, and and, and advancements in everything else will have 
casualties. You know, as uh, you you look at it, like the fast food industry or the grocery industry or things like that. You know, now they've got self checkout. You know, the big thing, uh, big thing people used to make jokes about at, at Walmart was the fact that they had you know thirty five registers across the front of the store and they only had two cashiers run it. You know, well then they made self checkout. You know, they made self checkout and now all of a sudden. You know, everybody can get through a line, but now people are complaining about having to scan their own groceries. You know, advancement is always going to come with casualties, just like freedom comes with casualties, you know, or, or, you know, consequences, casualties that, you know, however you want to say it. But everything that happens, good, bad or indifferent, will have consequences or, or byproducts that that will will adversely affect some but for the most part they're going to positively affect the most or the majority of people self-driving cars self-driving trucks um will we have them i'm sure uh, am i excited about it not at all <laughs> I, not at all <laughs> well you know but it's interesting that you like you say that because like and, and this, I guess, and this is why I kind of like having these discussions because, like, we're not really even talking about politics. We're just talking about, like, I don't know, theory or like how society works or like seeing different connections. But, like, to me, what that ended up tying to is the fact that in a society where, like, we're pushing, where innovation is going to happen and where, like, you know, there's always going to be this constant evolution. Um, and where the government really can't isn't isn't going to be the caretaker for everything you're you need to be free to be yourself to try to figure out what is the best part of you that can help you survive you know what i mean i guess like the, the and i think it goes into what we're saying about like that diversity of thinking diversity of background is in a society where you're on your own you got to be free to be yourself as much as possible um, to deal yep. with that. Like, yeah. And, and I think like the idea sometimes of like, you know, government like safety net, I, you know, I'm sympathetic to the idea of saying that you don't want people to suffer. I, and, and I don't know, and I'm, I don't even know enough to have any informed opinion about the viability of things or what needs to be there, or what doesn't need to be there. But one of the things that I've, I've kind of come upon in thinking about like the country and think about what unites us is I think that if you think, consider Americans, every one of us here is, um, you know, we're more self-reliant and more independent than people in any other part of the world. Um, we've self-selected into that and it, it's for everybody, right? It, it's whether your you know, ancestors came here with the Mayflower and dared to leave England and like kind of like toil in an unknown land um, to even if you're if you're a, a black American, your family was for, you know, could have been forced to be here and you had to survive and get by on your own. Um, if you're a Native American, you you've had to move around. And the fact that you, you're still here shows that you've been surviving and self-reliant to being like, you know, my wife's family flew here from Taiwan. And that was her family saying, like, you know what? We're here. We're in Taiwan. We could stay. But I think we're going to make it take a chance in America where we don't speak the language and we don't know the culture and we just know a handful of people. And let's, let's try that. Um, it takes a certain kind of person to either voluntarily do that or to survive being forced to do that. And that's what makes us, to me, I think, the you know different than any other country out there. Yeah, well, and, and like I said, we're 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 the most uh, multifaceted, multicultural, multi-ethnic uh, country on the planet, and you know, people of uh, it, it's one of the only places on the planet that people from all walks of life have an opportunity to uh, to make an incredible life for themselves and their family and. And and I think that's that's discounted by far too many people these days is the fact that that here you do have opportunity to do things in that in most places on this planet you you can't. And uh, so I think that's I do think that's in, incredibly important. I, I think it's unfortunate that it's unfortunate that it's discounted. But now, again, I'll go back to, you know, what I've said time and time again. You know, we have to have those conversations in order for people to to realize it, because a lot of times 
people get stuck in their own bubble. You know, you talked about, you know, being in your, your New York bubble. Um, people get stuck in their bubble and they just don't realize that, you know, the things that we're able to do here uh, are not things that most people can do in other countries, you know, and, and, and we're not in a situation uh, here. You talked about the safety net. And while I think the safety net is is more of a boondoggle uh, run by the government, just as most things government run are, than anything, but but having that safety net, you know, to provide for the um, you know the 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 most unfortunate among us um, has provided opportunity for people who who never otherwise would have had opportunity. So um, while it's while it's been completely botched, abused and, and misused in many cases, um, it, it has provided opportunity and, and, and things that that people that would would have never otherwise had. And even the even the poorest among us in the United States have a better or, or most of them have a better standard of living than than people in, in most places in the country. So. So we're all very fortunate to live in this country. We're all, uh, we, we should all be incredibly grateful for it. And uh, if people focused more on what they can be grateful for in this country, as opposed to the misconceptions and, and the, the negative things that are spread by politicians and the media, we'd be in a much happier place. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Um. It, my, you know, my thing on that is like one of the, one of the things I, I noticed when I was when I was I was a lawyer at like a, like a super large firm and worked hundred hour weeks and stuff like that is there's a certain there's a certain level of like OCD and almost like um it, it there's there's a level of like maybe dissatisfaction like at some point. I think you, you, I mean, and you probably know people like this too, but there are people who are like perfectionists or, they're, and, and like they're never happy. And I don't know if that's kind of part of what it is, but I do think that I, I see people and I can understand, but I can also understand the mindset because I've, I've had it before where like you, you focus on problems. And I think even at parenting, right? Like sometimes you can, as a parent, you can kind of like find, like, I want my kid to do this. They need to do this better. They need to do that better. They need to do this better. They need to do that better. And you forget about, the 95 percent that they're doing totally fine with so and i don't and i don't know maybe if if that's a society-wide thing if that's just certain people but i've been trying to be check that impulse and to find to be grateful for the things that we're going through because the last few years have been pretty hard and it'd be easy to kind of get upset about the the, the situation now even but instead just got to kind of like try to keep that positive mindset and the gratitude is so important yeah so well, I talk about it quite often on the podcast, Michael, about the reticular activating system in our brain and how we can only focus on so mm-hmm. many things at any given time. And when you start to focus, let's say you can only focus on on five, really focus on five things that are going on at any given time. So if you start to focus on the five things at work that bug you the most, you know, you start to tune out all the great things about your company or all the great things about your job or, or in your, your example that you just used, you know, if if you focus on the five things that your kid doesn't do well, you start to tune out and focus on, on, you're focused only on the bad and you can no longer process all of those good things that come along with it. So, and then your brain will just naturally look for ways to, um, continue that cycle because your brain doesn't want to be wrong. So, yeah. you know, if you constantly tell yourself that you hate your job or, or everything is messed up about your company, or, you know, you don't like the house that you live in because you got a leaky faucet and that, and, and the, the lights flicker once in a while or whatever, you start to lose focus on all the other things, all the other, all the great things. Well, it keeps me warm in the winter. It keeps me dry in the in the rainy season. You know, I, I, I've got a lock on the door that keeps predators out and things like that. And you start to lose focus on what to be grateful for. And you your 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 brain is constantly reinforcing that fact that I just don't like it here. 
you know, and, yeah. and whatever. So, um, so that, that's a very important thing that, that people need to consciously think about it, it, I don't care if it's, if it's your job, if it's your house, if it's your kids, if it's your car, if it's whatever, focus on the things about them that you can be grateful for and try to tune out <clears throat> all those things. Don't ignore those things that are bad, but ignore the things that you don't have control over. Try to fix the things that are bad and, and just be, you know, just kind of like the serenity prayer says, you know, grant me the serenity to accept the things that I cannot change, change the things that I can and the wisdom to know the difference. The same thing with that reticular activating system. Focus on the things that you can change. Try to build solutions to make those things better, but focus on the positive. Be grateful for all the things in your life that are so, uh, you know, so good. And your brain will, will naturally find more things to be grateful for. And you will naturally become a more happy and satisfied human being. And, uh, and then you'll find better ways to yeah. tune out all the negativity in, uh, in social media, <laughs> media, and the political spectrum. You know, and and I think you know, and, and part of that is also like when I, when I talk like when I talk about like what I'm trying to do with my my travel company is I say like look I I know there are problems out there but we've got to focus on like looking at the, the good things and and fostering that understanding and if you lose sight of the good things then you also almost lose the energy to fix the bad thing at some point it just becomes a grind so I think just as human beings it's uh you know it's 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 health it's not delusional to focus on the the you know the the good things um it's necessary so that you can confront the bad things and pr- confront the bad things productively with other people because if you're bitter and angry about the three four things that you've been focusing on that you're not going to cooperate you barely you're torturing yourself you're certainly not going to be a very pleasant person to work with uh, with people on the other side especially those who you might disagree with for sure no that's so, absolutely right um yeah so, um, so we only have a, we probably should wrap up, but we haven't talked much about like Minnesota, um, for somebody like myself who doesn't know much about the state. Can you give like a, a you know, a few minute primer on, <laughs> on, on Minnesota is, I mean, is it, uh, like what, what's Minnesota like? I'm happy to talk about New York city too, if you want, but like for your, sure. for, for our purposes, like what, tell me about Minnesota. Right. So Minnesota is, is. Uh, a very rural, you know, like a, a farming state. There's a lot of uh, a lot of farming, a lot of uh, cattle, uh, you know, a lot of agriculture. I guess is is the best way to say it. So there's a lot of agriculture here. Most people, when they think of Minnesota, they think about Minneapolis, St. Paul, and uh, the reality is, is, is Minneapolis and St. Paul is a very, very poor representation of what what Minnesota actually is. Unfortunately, the whole state is governed <laughs> like it is like it's Minneapolis, St. Paul. But the reality is, is it's not, you know, the majority uh, of, of Minnesota is rural. There are some incredible people here. Um, the, the state in, in many ways is very beautiful, uh, especially like I said, the area that I'm in right now up in Virginia, Minnesota, up in the Iron Range, you know, it's, it's just trees and forests and, and just a lot of green and hills and, and lakes. And it, it's, it's gorgeous. But, uh, um, yeah. And, and, you know, unfortunately just, just like the state uh, of New York, uh, I've spent time in the state of New York and, and in many, many places around our country. Um, you know, the state of Illinois is, is governed as if it's Chicago and thought of as if it's Chicago, but it's not because there's a lot more to, to Illinois than there is in Chicago. There's a lot more to, to New York than there is in, than there is, you know, New York city and, and Buffalo, uh, the same way, Minnesota, uh, Minnesota, there's a lot more going on in Minnesota than, than what is represented or, or thought of when it comes to, uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul and, and that metro area, uh, which has become an absolute mess. <laughs> and how, and the, <laughs> what um and you said it gets like 35 degrees below zero during the winter like what i i've only felt zero degrees and i my the inside of my nostrils started to freeze i can't imagine what 35 degrees below zero does does to a, a person yeah well it, yeah, that? zero degrees your nose probably freezes up a little bit your nose hairs get a little froze when it's 35 below zero your nose just slams shut and stays stuck that way it's <laughs> i mean it, and if you pinch your it, nose it just stays that way 
Oh yeah, it, it well it, that may be an exaggeration, but you but, can act, no, it, it's probably not an exaggeration. No, you don't even want your nose exposed when it's thirty five below zero. But uh, yeah, I mean, there's parts of Minnesota where it, you know, with the wind chill and everything else, I mean, you're you're getting close to hundred below zero at, at times because you start getting a big nasty wind uh, along with uh, with thirty five forty below zero. Uh, actual air temperature and uh yeah things get get dangerously cold dangerously fast and uh yeah you just don't want to be outside there's no there's nothing good about being outside during those kind of temperatures um you know air doesn't move well <laughs> it hurts to breathe it you know the, the the air hurts your face and and stuff so so yeah th- those periods of time when it when it gets that cold and it's not it's not like it stays that cold day after day after day but uh, but there are definitely times in Minnesota where it will stay below zero for multiple days on end, and and never get above the zero temperature. So, not a fun time to be in the state of Minnesota. <laughs> but there are people that are out snowmobiling and doing other stuff, you know, snowmobiling, ice fishing, doing stuff when it's that cold, and they're just diehard Minnesotans that do it. Is that do you do ice fishing or or the snowmobiling or anything like that? I do some ice fishing um, when I have time, but uh, snowmobiling is never something I've I've gotten into a lot of. I, I mean, I know a lot of people that do it, and and they're very passionate about it, and and it's you know it's an incredible amount of fun. I mean, I've I've done it in the past, but it's just not something I've ever got into really. Now, and does a fish taste different if you catch it ice fishing versus I don't know, like off, off the coast of Florida or something like that, or not during the brutal winter uh you know there's some people that that say that it it tastes different you know catching them through the ice because the colder water and and whatever uh, i guess i've never personally been able to to tell the difference but uh there's people that say that it does i i can't say one way or the other mm-hmm. so one of the things and, and i we when i we will definitely wrap up um but for like new york like when i try to talk to people about like ex- or i guess explaining new york is that you know it, it to understand new york you have to understand like twenty seven thousand people per square mile right you have to understand like you know and and we'll like when where i when we take the kids out to like the more rural parts of new york and we'll drive along a street and you might see one house every you know mile or half mile and we'll be like guys you know we live in one building that has like 65 families in this one little building on our block and when you're in the different parts of the country it's just completely different when you have that that, that you don't have that population density it just changes a lot and like for me i like it because i think i'm a pretty introverted person but i don't actually like being introverted so having that many people around kind of forces me to be out there and like i and i like the the sense of like kind of like new things and new people and like you eat the city itself is something that you could never you'll you'll never see all of it and it's always changing so it's impossible to um, and the people that are here that stay here kind of self-select into liking that. And there's good and bad points to that. But I think the population density is like the key thing to understand, to understand like New York. Um, like, would you say, is there something about like Minnesota that you could say like this, if you understand this part, this part about Minnesota, you would understand Minnesota. And, and you know, we can exclude Minneapolis from this if we need to. Yeah, I, I I guess I I don't really know if I would if I would be able to pinpoint anything like that to to be able to understand it. Um, yeah, my my big thing is is like I said, uh, the 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 dynamic between what is in the city because there, there's certainly places inside. Uh, the city of Minneapolis, St. Paul, where you have that kind of population density, maybe not, you know, 27,000 within a square mile, but, uh, but then there's other parts of Minnesota um, where you may have one family per square mile. So, right. so there's yeah, a, yeah. A, a very, very large spectrum when it comes to population density and, and the way that people live, uh, much like in the state of New York, like I said, um, the way that people live uh, in in those different or on those different ends of that population density spectrum uh, is is entirely different. 
It's entirely different. I mean, they, they've got virtually nothing in common except for the two letters uh, that, that signify the state on their, their mailing address, you know, but, but uh, so yeah, there's, there's a very broad spectrum of, uh, of the lifestyles, values, uh, the kind of things that people uh, think about and experience in their daily lives and, and, and things like that in the state of Minnesota anyway. Yeah. But, okay. So, yeah. Similar, similar dynamic. Yeah. And, and I think at the end of the day, it's really not about, you know, it's about learning how to coexist because there's just always going to be those different ways of living. And I think that's what we're both trying to, I guess, advance in our own way. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. Um, I think I'm, I'm I, I don't know that I'll be able to keep the kids at bay for much longer. So I should probably wrap up. I'm sure you have things to do on your, your yep. business trip as well. Um, <laughs> so um, before we wrap up, can I ask, like, you know, what, what gives you what gives you hope at the end of the day? Well, what gives me hope is that there's still people out there every day uh, fighting that battle, trying to make the world a better place. Um, I, I've met several of them through my podcast that, uh, you know, there's different organizations like, like the one that we're both part of, Braver Angels, uh, the people over at the Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism, um, you know, FAIR is another incredible organization. My friends over at Beyond Barriers USA, there's all these different people out there that are doing just incredible work to trying to better, you know, to try and better the world in which we live. And, uh, you know, they give me hope. Those, those voices give me hope. Those people that are out there, uh, fighting that fight, uh, you know, people that are still willing to, you know, put their voice out there and, uh, and, and try to better the world in which we live. So they, they give me hope. Yeah, that's great. For sure. Okay. Well, well, thanks so much for, you know, responding to the random email from, from me to talk. And I really appreciate the, the sharing this hour with you, especially during a business. Well, I've appreciate. Yeah. I've appreciated the conversation, Michael. I'm really glad you, uh, I'm really glad you sent that email and I'm, I'm glad for what you're doing, uh, with your American tributaries podcast and, and, uh, keep it up, man. It's, uh, all right. it's all about keeping people curious and keeping the conversation going. Yeah, for sure. All right. And uh, and you can check out Wilk's uh, podcast, Derate the Hate, and um, all else that he's doing as well. So, all right. Thanks so much, Wilk. We'll be in touch, I'm sure. Yeah, definitely.